One of the fundamental, if not the fundamental beliefs, misbeliefs that I've discovered, Paul, is that we were in the Garden of Eden, in heaven on earth, whether that's literal or metaphorical, doesn't matter. We got kicked out, and the belief is it's a one-way street out forever. And I'm like, well, who does that serve? No. This is the new, this is the third step. The first one was we're in, then we're out, and now we're we're coming back in again through the realization of our agency and the fact that we can, as individuals and collectively, co-create this new story by declaration, by saying, look, this is the name of the new story. I say so, and then I live into that, and I live from that. Welcome to the Mind Tracks podcast with breakthrough ideas to live your best life possible and how to make it happen. I'm Paul Sheely, and today we'll be joined by Martin Root. Martin Root is an international speaker and consultant committed to reconnecting people and businesses with their natural source of creativity, innovation, and genius. He is president of Livelihood, a management consulting firm, and has worked with many of America's leading corporations to help expand their outlook and position themselves for the future. Martin's newest book, Project Heaven on Earth, helps you unlock your soul's deep longing for the kind of world you want and empowers the new story of what it means to be a human and what it means to be humanity. Hello, Martin. Welcome to the podcast. It's such a delight to be with you. Thank you for being here. Paul, I'm I'm so looking forward to this. Thank you so much. Good to always be with you. Oh, thanks so much. Well, I love your work, Heaven on Earth, uh, through Project Heaven on Earth, or I guess we could say Project Heaven on Earth. Either way, uh, you're helping to bring a grand vision, a new story to humanity. And with a couple of simple questions, every one of us can get on board and participate. So we'll get into that in a bit. First, I kind of like to set the stage for those who don't know of your work. Tell us a little bit about your work in spirituality and business, how you got started in it, how you landed here. Well, I'll go way back to the beginning, in which case I always knew that I was here to change the world. I remember as a young kid sitting on the porch at my home reading two or three newspapers a day, and it was something that was always just normal to me, like, your name is Paul. I'm here to change the world. It never, I never thought that was strange or weird or just the way it was. And um, took a lot of personal development courses, uh, worked with a guy in Chicago, Bob Branscombe and Tim Klaus, and they, they did a course called The Success Factor which was about setting goals from your soul, not from your mind. And one of the things that they talked about, which I loved was achieving beyond what you believe possible. There's a belief, Paul, that in order to achieve something, you have to believe that you can do it. And his contention was, but that locks you into a a notion of, well, what if I don't believe it? And I still want to do it. What if I want to end hunger? What if I want to have sustainable peace in the Middle East. That's impossible because I don't believe it. He said you could go beyond that. And through commitment and declaration being and clarity on your goals, you could set some outrageous goals and achieve them. And so I became interested in the whole issue of vision and uh, setting goals and, and also why people don't get their vision. So I started a company in Toronto and we did the personal development course. I I got into then vision, I got into uh, consulting around vision, spoke four times at the Harvard Business School on vision. My corporate clients included Sony Pictures, Southern California Edison, um, Marin Merrill Dow, Consumer Pharmaceuticals, so large corporations, but it was always based on the individual and what he or she wanted with respect to their vision. Then in about the late 80s, I guess, 
I was uh, I just coming back from spoken, speaking at Harvard, uh, speaking at the Canadian American Chambers of Commerce in Hong Kong. I went into this funk. What's the funk about? I have no idea. It was like two pieces of wood that just separated, you know, tongue and groove that just were different. Why? I don't know. Was it my marriage? No. Was it my work? No. What was it? I went to a Augustinian monastery and I got this message in my head. It's about God. This was in 19, early 80s. And what was interesting to me at the time was I got scared because you can't talk about spirituality and work. People will think you're proselytizing. Everybody in Toronto said, don't talk about it, don't talk about it. I went to Los Angeles and talked to many people there, including our mutual friend, Jack Canfield, all of whom said, go for it. And I saw that the issue, my, my concern was your thoughts were I to speak about spirituality and work because you were thinking that I was going to proselytize, which was not true. It was an inquiry. What is spirituality in the workplace and how could we bring that about? So I began that inquiry and the, the, the real breakthrough was people saying to me, you can't talk about this, you can't talk about, it. but why? Because when I came back from Los Angeles, number one, I said to people, again, I want to speak about spirituality and work. No, you can't, you can't. Now it was interesting to me because I had not defined what I meant by spirituality and work, nor was I requesting anything from them. I kept saying, no, but I want to talk. I, I'm not, I don't want to do anything with you. And that's when the second penny really dropped. And I saw that the fear about spirituality at work is that I'm going to proselytize. I'm going to try to shove this answer down your throat. But underneath that was the fear that I had, I was right. And you were in, in essence wrong. I knew and you didn't know. No. And so what I, what I said was, rather than having spirituality in the workplace as an answer, what if we had it as a question, as an inquiry, as an ongoing question? And that just blew the whole thing wide open. Oh, that's, this is powerful because I think you've also made a significant distinction between religion in the workplace and spirituality in the workplace. And spirituality and religion aren't necessarily the same thing. Well, let me speak to that because for some people, you know, people would say that to me and I would say, well, it depends on how you view it because for some people it is about religion in the workplace and for some people it's about spirituality. But behind both of those is how do they hold them? Do they want mm -hmm. to impose their definition of either a religious point of view or a spiritual point of view on you? That won't work. If it's an inquiry, if we talk about what is it for you? Because people would say, well, Martin, before we begin, you tell me what you mean by spirituality and work. And I would say, no, because if I tell you and you agree with me, conversation over. If I tell you and you disagree with me, conversation over. What if you tell you? Because then it's open. And that blew it right open. Uh, and so I started doing, uh, helping to set up conferences around the world. I wanted to get this to be a permissible conversation in the world of work. 30 years ago, if I went and spoke to you at work, we could talk about uh, profit, revenue, marketing, the traditional conversations in work. I could talk to you about my career aspirations. That's personal. But what we also saw over the years was, I'm an alcoholic, I'm gay, I'm black, I'm a woman, I do drugs. Each time one of those conversations came in, oh, you can't talk about it, you can't. But we found ways to talk about it that were useful both to the enterprise and to the individual. And so what I was suggesting was that's the same here. So it changes the story of who we are as co-workers as well. It Correct. begins to create a different narrative of being together and having a common goal. Our differences are okay. If before what I had to do was give up a part of me to be at work, that's not satisfying for me and it doesn't bring my full self to the workplace. If mm. I'm permitted to talk about my spirituality and or my religion in a way that's not proselytizing, 
if you choose, and if you don't choose, fine, end of the story, then it, it brings more of me to the workplace. And that satisfies on many different levels. That's excellent. So uh, one of the things that you wrote in your book, Project Heaven on Earth, it says, you state that a new era of Promise, creativity, responsibility, dedication, and devotion is our soul's deepest desire. And I want to know how you came to see that that's true for all of us, that that is really our soul's deepest desire. That's a very powerful, deep question, Paul. Thank you. <clears throat> if you look at my history, I did a lot of work around vision. I did a lot of work of around soul setting goals as opposed to mind setting goals spirituality in the workplace and then the newest piece of work uh heaven on earth all of that as i look back i didn't know it at the time but as i look back it's about what is our soul's desire <coughs> excuse me for the kind of life and work and nation and world that we long for <clears throat> and isn't it time to now bring that forth in the world particularly given the, the turmoil on the surface of the ocean now. Yeah, and there is quite a lot. Um, there were three questions that you talked about that seemed to bring you to an awareness of this heaven on earth concept, and that's where I'd like to move toward. Why are we all here? What's our mission, our vision? What is humanity's purpose? And it seemed that by exploring that, that led to the proposition that we're really all here to establish heaven on earth. Could you say what that perspective shift was for you? Yeah, let me, let me just make the transition. So now I've done 20, 30 years on spirituality and work, and I was going to do a keynote address at a conference in Santa Fe on business and spirituality. And before I was going out to speak, I was meditating, praying, and I heard in my mind, if every business in the world is spiritual, is that what you want? And I said, hmm, not ultimately, because, because business is the temporal power in the world today. Yes, if, we could, if we could transform business, we could transform the world. And then this thought popped into my head, Oh, you mean heaven on earth? Honest, and I went, I mean, I jumped <laughs> and I, excuse, you know, I swore and I said, well, you can't talk about that. You can't talk about heaven on earth. And I thought, well, but why? I can talk to you about hell on earth, can I? Isn't that a permissible conversation? And a lot of us know what that looks like. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I began this inquiry, not even knowing what it was, what's heaven. And I went around to people asking, what's heaven on earth for you? What's heaven on earth for you? What's heaven on earth for you? I wanted to get the lay of the land to, to see if there, in fact, was a lay of the land. And out of that long inquiry came the three questions you're referring to, which I'd like to. Well, we didn't talk about this before, but can I ask you the three questions? Yes, you may. I want to I want to move to one thing before that, if we could. Sure. Because these these questions really open it up for all of us. And, and I love the simplicity of it. And the recognition that you and I have talked about in the past that everybody knows the answers to this. <laughs> it's like getting the lay of the land, as you said, you asked, what is heaven on earth? What is heaven on earth? Everybody knew, which was so cool. I, I'd like to say that there's this phrase you use, metaphorical software. Yeah. This idea that we're creating a new story for humanity and the heaven on earth concept is like a meta metaphorical software for the brain. Tell, tell me if you can what that meant to you. Yeah, so uh, heaven on earth is new metaphorical software. Imagine that you have a new piece of software, you install it, you boot it up. What it gives you Paul, is a new possibility that didn't exist before. And once you're there, new possibilities open up, new potentials open up. You can do things that you never thought of. So if we think of Project Heaven on Earth as metaphorical software, that is 
giving you the possibility to have the, the your deep soul's longing for the kind of life, work, nation, and 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 uh, globe, humanity, and, and physicality of the globe that you want. Bang. So, I as I said, I, I'd start asking people, "What's heaven on earth? What's in heaven on earth?" And that was not the right question because it wasn't uh, sublime enough or precise enough. And so, what I began to to ask was. I've got these three questions and I'm going to ask them of you with your permission. Yeah, and, please. And uh, for those of you watching or listening, just stop it after I ask the question and answer it for yourself so you can see where we're going here. All right. And I'm going to just take some notes on what you say. So question one, recall a time when you experienced heaven on earth. What was going on? Recall a time when you experienced heaven on earth. What was going on? Yeah, for me, it was in presenting my work and seeing somebody remove the barriers from them, their mind and step into a new possibility of who they were. And uh, it, it's what I call, it, it's kind of a liberation that mm. occurred when someone realized that the fears that were blocking them up until then were made up and they didn't have to have them anymore. It was as if they had set themselves free. Now that's that's probably the biggest one in my work. And uh, heaven on earth for me is also standing in a mountain stream with a fly rod in my hand, fishing for trout in the Rocky Mountains. It's, it's a connection, you referred to it in your book, the connection to awe wonder and beauty of the natural world. That's for me that there's a connection. And to me, the similarity between those two experiences is that person who is liberated is now in the state of awesomeness of their own lives. They're in awe of their own potential. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. And I'm going to come back and go over the questions again in terms of why I asked them. Question number two, here's a magic wand. So pretend you have a magic wand. And with this magic wand, in your mind's eye, oh, or, or if you have it really, a pencil or a pen. Imagine you have a magic wand and with this wand, you can have heaven on earth. What is heaven on earth for you? For me, heaven on earth is that every everyone, all of humanity has liberated their personal genius, that they have come to an awareness of the magnificent power, the gifts that are within them that are here for them to contribute to the world. So they are applying that genius. They're applying those gifts to solving the big challenges that are <clears throat> in their own lives, in their own families, in their communities, their workplace, they're applying that genius. So I, I've, um, I came to recognize for me, Martin, that my proposition and work is that the purpose of education is the liberation of human genius. And when I share that with colleges and universities where I speak, they are thunderstruck at the idea, right? That, oh, we're, it's not about us putting information into people's minds. It's about people really liberating that genius potential that's within them. Very I think true. we're all born geniuses. So why not have everybody recognize that? Lovely, lovely. And the third question, Paul, what simple, easy, concrete step or steps, what simple, easy, concrete step will you take in the next 24 hours to have more of that heaven on earth? I think what I'll do is invite Martin Root to come on to a podcast with me and talk about heaven on earth. <laughs> And, and steer the conversation toward liberating human genius. <laughs> and, I mean, obviously, because that's already taken place, 
it's really to get that into my writing, a book that I'm writing called Guardians of Change is really about liberating that brilliance. And it's to continue that process in the next 24 hours, write another few paragraphs or a few pages on that topic. Lovely, Paul. Really, thank you. Well, thanks I, for asking. I, you know, it was quite a while ago at the Transformational Leadership Council that you proposed those questions. And I, it was so wonderful to recognize how everyone immediately gets it, that there is a heaven on earth. We know what that is. And there are steps that we can take, simple, small, easy steps we can take right now right. to start bringing that about. If we could suspend our disbelief that what could one person do to change the world, right? If we could just suspend that, we're really liberating humanity's opportunity to create a new story for itself. Why, why am I even on this interview? <laughs> you can interview yourself. Brilliant, <laughs> Paul. Let me go through the three questions. I, no, that you, yeah. you just, you know how much I respect and love you. And to hear this back from you means a, a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So question one, recall a time when you experienced heaven on earth. You said presenting my work, seeing it remove the barriers, <clears throat> that people step into a new possibility, liberation, that the fears that people have are made up. This will set people free. <clears throat> That's around the work. And then you also talked about the personal fly fishing for trout. And the, the, the thing that holds it all together is awe, the experience of awe. Now, I asked you the question, recall the time you experienced heaven on earth, what you didn't do. And Paul, what like 99 0.999% of people do not do is ask, Martin, what do you mean by heaven on earth? <laughs> Nobody right. asks that question. <laughs> and you notice I didn't define it. No. I just went into the questions and bang, you answered. And it's because there's what I call within you an already knowing about what heaven on earth is. And when the question is asked, recall a time when my child was born, you know, having a wonderful meal in Italy, all kinds of walking in nature, what you talked about. The content is different, but the notion is the same. There is this already knowing. All right, that's question one. Question two, here's a magic wand and with it you can have heaven on earth. What's heaven on earth? The reason for the magic wand, Paul, is to remove the necessity of having to know how you're going to do it. And if you don't have to know how, because that's the magic wand's job, oh, well, Martin, let me just tell you what heaven on earth is. And people just jump in. Everybody um, liberating their, their personal genius, their magnificent power, contributing that to the world, applying their genius to solving the big problems in their personal life and in the world. The purpose, for example, and I love this statement for you, from you, the purpose of education is the liberation of human genius. What a wonderful definition of what heaven on earth. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and then, so that's the second question. The third question, I don't wanna just leave it at, okay, what's heaven on earth? That's, that can be, not must, can be overwhelming, it's impossible, all the stuff that comes up. If, however, you take a small, simple step, a step that you know you're gonna be successful at in the next 24 hours, then you've entered into the arena. And the arena is that we are co-creating the new story of what it means to be a human and what it means to be humanity, both the individual and the collective of humanity. And that story is called, we're co-creating heaven on earth. It's time, it's time. Who wants to put up with all this garbage in the Israeli, Palestinian, the, the Ukrainian, Russian, the threats of AI, aside from the goodness of the threats, CRISPR technology, the environment, all the major stuff that we know about. 30 years ago, when I started talking about this, people were like, oh, no, that's impossible. You're nuts. I don't get that reaction, Paul, now, because yeah, there's this deep desire to, you know what? You're right. Let me go for what I want here. And now, 
Right. We really don't have time to wait any longer. And I believe that all of us that are here on the planet really signed on for this moment in human history where this great turning is occurring. In your book, which, by the way, one of the things I loved about it was how many examples you gave of people really pursuing it, pursuing heaven on earth and their work and in their personal lives and how much they find it over yeah. and over and over again. So it's really inspiring in a lot thank of ways. You, thank you. Yeah, because what I want to get across with the book is this is more than just a good idea. People are actually doing this worldwide. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the examples, but go ahead. Yeah, the, the, the worldwide nature of it, I think, is great. As my doctoral dissertation talked about the importance of the transpersonal, that knowing that we're participating in something that millions of other people all over the world are also participating. It's not just a crazy idea that landed on you. It really is a collective movement. Very important. The thing that I appreciated also is that there are some supports to the work of pursuing heaven on earth in our own lives. And you mentioned three ways. One is to move from belief to commitment. Another is being responsible, which is different than taking responsibility, but really being responsible. Um, and I love that distinction. I would like you to talk more about that. And the third was achieving a result beyond what you believe is possible. Now, you've already spoken to that, but I want to underscore this because uh, Abraham Maslow, in his work, talked about the hierarchy of needs, and he talked about this, the highest level in his work is was actually not the highest level that he was researching. He was researching a level beyond self-actualize, and that's called self-transcendent. Yep. And he talked about peak experiences that recall a time when you experience heaven on earth. That's an example of a transcendent experience. And achieving results beyond what you believe is possible is being able to step into that transcendent experience on an ongoing basis, super important, very helpful. So let's go back and talk about one. these three yeah, types of support. So the first one is the move from belief to commitment. And it ties in with the third one about beyond what you believe is possible. And it bears repeating. The belief is, the assumption is, in order for me to do something, in order for me to do believe that I can do X, I need to believe that I can do X. Well, and I want to I want to say that the one thing that will take someone away from doing something is that they don't believe it. Correct. I mean, that's the that is the quickest ejection seat button ever. I don't believe it. I'm never going to be able. To. So to really embrace that that you don't have to believe it. You know, our friend Chen Yi Lin says, you believe it, it's true, it happens. You don't believe it, it's still true, and it still happens. <laughs> and I'm stepping beyond both of those comments. And so right. if, the, if the assumption is I need to believe X in order to do X, then all I will do is X. But what mm. if what I want to do is have the complete end, the sustainable end of hunger? The sustainable end of war. I mean, given my homelessness, I, disease. Yes. Yeah, it's impossible because I don't believe it's possible. Oh, everything stops. Either you then lower your target. I will. I would like to have hunger in only half the world. Well, okay. You lower the target, or you wait for the belief to come. Meanwhile, back at the ranch the problem continues. So what happens, what would happen if you said, it's not necessary to believe this and I'm going for it. And let me tell you the proof. Have you ever in your own life or seen in somebody else's life, them accomplish something they wanted to accomplish after which they said, I don't believe I did that. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe that happened, right? How could they say that? <laughs> I know, and I often say, well, 
wait, didn't it just happen? <laughs> so can you now remove that doubt? Uh, correct. Because it challenges yeah. the belief that I have to believe I, I've done, but you've just done it. <laughs> so <laughs> what if you believed beyond, well, excuse me, what if you set a goal beyond what you believe possible and committed to that goal? So my goal is heaven on earth, the entire world. Well, but that's impossible. We could never happen. It's never happened before. Who am I? Look at the, all the problems in the world. I have a, a bazillion reasons to prove that this can't happen. Thank you very much. And my commitment by declaration, that's how you create commitment. I commit, I declare that we will have heaven on earth. And then all of a sudden, oh my God, now what's the next tiny step you can take in that arena? The next time, and all of a sudden, the momentum builds and builds and builds. That's why that's so important. It's not necessary to believe that you can do something in order to do it. It's fine if you do, but look at what you want to achieve or have achieved in the world and then go there. That's powerful, especially when you realize that it's your commitment to take a next step that's ultimately going to bring the proof positive yes. that this step is possible. You can't, Correct. he who does not take the action will never notice that they have the power, right? But you do the thing, you have the power. Don't do the thing, you don't have the power. It's self, what's the, um, I forgot the word, not self-proving, self-proving, self, yeah. self evidentiary. Now, let me Quad go to era demonstrandum. It was to be proven, yes. My Latin. Um, <laughs> so the second point was being responsible. The way we look at responsibility is, in order for me to have heaven on earth, I need to be responsible for it. Oh, but that's, you don't understand, that's so weighty. And, and I associate responsibility with shame and guilt and burden and all the dark, heavy stuff around responsibility. And so my friend Bob Branscom, I think wherever it came from, from him rather, he's saying, would you be willing to be responsible? Mm -hmm. I went, yes. He said, that's all it needs. Just be willing to be responsible because then it opens the, the arena to you. And that was so brilliant, so brilliant. And yeah, so and one of, the, go ahead. Well, the idea that if, you're not responsible yes. for what's going on in the world, then you are a victim of whatever is going on in the world. You're not at cause. And Correct. so like commitment, and number one, you're taking action means that you're a causative agent of the world that you want to see. And if you're willing to take responsibility, you will then also place yourself in the position of creator, of causate, causation for what it is you desire. I want to make a slight little linguistic distinction there. It's not taking okay. responsibility. It's being responsible. Thank you. Yeah. That's a huge, huge distinction. So, so ex explain that distinction. Well, taking responsibility again implies weight. Okay. And, and all the associations that you have when you were a kid, you know, were you responsible for that? Oh my God. All the negative around responsible as opposed to Look, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm committed to it and I'm willing to be responsible. And it opens. Good. You, Excellent. You can, yeah. You can step into the arena that way in, with power. Yes. yes any yes. any victim statement, you know, I can't because be, my, my friend um, Jeroen Drotman in, in uh, Holland says it's not because, it's be cause. Mm, yes. That's juicy, isn't it? It is juicy. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, you referred to both inner and outer relationships. There are a number of ways in which we can really focus our responsible efforts toward creating heaven on earth. Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of target areas that may be more resonant for an individual. Certainly in the work that I do in human development, is a lot about our inner relationships. And when somebody learns that they can be responsible for their interior state, 
they also discover that they're sharing it more with others in their outer relationships. And when there's a problem out there, it's easy to go to blame. If they would just get their act together, I'd be far more at peace in, in my world. But there is a shift also that can occur there when we recognize how we can shift our outer relationships in a more responsible way. Now, the various areas so, that you... Oh, right. that's, that's what I wanted to get into. That's where I thought you were going. Should we look yeah. at those then? Yeah, please. So what happened, Paul, is when I asked those three questions that I just asked you hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, I, I began to think, well, look, is there a lay of the land here? Are, are there themes that keep coming up repetitively? And in fact, there were, there are, and I call those the gateways into heaven on earth. So we'll just go through and, and the book Project Heaven on Earth goes into much more detail. So this is in no order, but uh, let's talk about inner. There are those people who say, in order for me to have heaven on earth, I have to have it inside of me. So I do things that create more heaven on earth. In your case, fly fishing, or it could be uh, going to a gallery, painting, singing, walking, whatever brings you more heaven on earth within you. Sharing cool ideas with people. Also, yeah. yeah. And the other is the parts that are shut down. You go to therapy, you go to work workshops, you talk to friends to, to clean that gunk out. So that's the gateway of inner. Then there's a the gateway of value, excuse me, of relationship. Uh, no, values, values. So there are those people who say, oh, the way you bring heaven on earth is through the value of joy, the value of harmony. My wife, when she walks into a room, you're going to feel joy. Our friend Tim, his is order. He can walk into a pigsty of an office or a, a home and after he's done, it's, it's, it's sensational because he brings order. So those are people who live a value because the premise is this value lived throughout the world is heaven on earth. Another gateway is relationship, relationship with myself. So if my relationship with myself is not heaven on earth, what do I need to do to clean that up or express more of it? My relationship with another person, my relationship with God, cleaning all of those up. Then we go to people who say, well, the, the outer world, the outer world, the number one outer world issue is ending a suffering, not making it better, not less hunger, but no hunger, no poverty, no war, no illness. Those are people who say, here's my, what I call keystone suffering. And if that's when that suffering goes, when there's no hunger in the world, all the other sufferings will collapse. There are people who say institutions. What if the institution of law, government, uh, business, religion, what if its purpose was to co-create heaven on earth? What would it do and not do? And then there are people who say nation. My nation is a heaven on earth nation. And they, that's where they operate from. And then the, the seventh is this here now. This present moment is heaven on earth. But the belief that it's not is what keeps us away. So those seven gateways, each of one, it, we, I go into depth in the book because, and it took me years to like describe them and, and see how the reader could really get that gateway for themselves and open it up. So some readers have one gateway, some have more, but these are the seven that just kept coming up all the time. Yeah, I appreciate that we don't have to clean up all seven, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> It's, it's really where I am called to do that work in my life. Right there is where I can apply, exactly. take that next step. And it's that also makes it pretty easy because uh, as people will read your book, they'll see, well, this is both diagnostic as well as prescriptive, you know, yes. diagnosis where my most intense suffering or disconnect from heaven on earth resides and what I might do with very simple next steps to remediate that and really fulfill on the promise of the great gifts that are given to us. Now, you quoted David Wolfson in your book. He said, um, we all share responsibility for the current state of the world. We also all share responsibility for the shape of the future. And I love that because the over our 
overarching theme of your book is creating a new story for humanity. Do you want to say a little bit more about this restoring of the human experience in the world? The way you create a new story, which is, I think, so important now because the current story is so overwhelming in its negativity, so overwhelming in the fact that I can't do anything about it. There are powers mm -hmm. outside of myself, all the rationales that people use to keep the current story in place. And this book and this work about Project Heaven on Earth is saying, no, that's not accurate. You forgot the agency that you have and that we have to have the kind of story co-creating and experiencing heaven on earth that we long for. And now in, the, in human evolution, now's the time to do it. One of the fundamental, if not the fundamental beliefs, misbeliefs that I've discovered, Paul, is that we were in the Garden of Eden, in heaven on earth, whether that's literal or metaphorical, doesn't matter. We got kicked out. And the belief is it's a one-way street out forever. And I'm like, well, who does that serve? No, this is the new, this is the third step. The first one was we're in, then we're out, and now we're, we're coming back in again through the realization of our agency and the fact that we can, as individuals and collectively, co-create this new story by declaration, by saying, look, this is the name of the new story. I say so, and then I live into that, and I live from that. It's awesome because it gives meaning and purpose to every single day that we open our eyes to live this life. Well, thank you so much, Martin. I mean, this has been fabulous. I love you. I love your work. I want to read something that you wrote, and then maybe you could give us a a final benediction, a final word for I want to, this podcast. I want to talk about, did I, I want to just show people, this is available on okay. Amazon. And yes. did we talk about the title? Well, I mentioned project and project as being both a verb and a noun, Correct. but we didn't talk very much about it. Most people, when they look at the title, see project heaven on earth. And there's another way of looking at the same title, which is project. So project as in a state of being and project is in a state of doing. So being, doing so that we have heaven on earth. That book is available on Amazon by a million. <laughs> no, <laughs> Thank buy, you. Yes. I actually buy and buy it in hard copy. It is available in, in electronic version, but buy it in hard copy because it, it makes it there's a tangible weight to it. And I'm asking people to buy three, one for yourself, one for somebody in your life right now who you know would love it or needs it, who is that person, and one for somebody coming into your life. And Paul, if people, uh, this is my outrageous, called the case for heaven on earth. You buy, when you buy 20 or more books off Amazon and send me the receipt at martin at projectheavenonearth.com, martin at projectheavenonearth.com, I'll do a free heaven on earth consult with you or a free one hour webinar for your group. I know wow. I want to get wow. this out into the world at the next level. Well, the book is beautifully written. It's an easy read. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of great structure in it. A lot of great stories, a lot of good open space, and a lot of good thinking space for writing ideas down that are triggered by the inquiries that you're asking us to explore. So thank you. thank you for writing it. And thanks for that cool offer. I think that's super good idea. It is definitely a pass around book. It really is. So you wrote, I believe that given the tools, the vast majority of us would want to participate in the formation of a new human story that inspires hope for the future gives us feeling of positive momentum and ushers in a sense of expansiveness. United, we can co-create a grand planetary adventure, each person adding their inspiration, spirit, voice, and gifts. Now is the time to begin the next chapter in the collective story of humanity's evolution, a positive chapter we've been waiting and longing for, and he recent, just a moment ago said longing for, 
And I love that. I really do believe it's true. The time is now, the place is here, the person is you. Final thought, beautiful statement that you made. It's like, I, you know, that was years ago that I wrote that and I, I'm listening to you and I'm going, my God, that's right on the button. Well, one of the things that I got out of writing the book was I wouldn't go on until it, it actually expressed what my soul wanted. And hearing that, it's like that still rings, resonates so deeply true for me. It's time, Paul. It's time for, you know, you, you said the benediction that may we all have our so our deep souls longing made real in the world made concrete in the world now not we don't have to wait anymore it is the time is now the person is yes. you the, the people is we so let us all dare to dream beyond our beliefs of what's possible and recognize that be the case thank you so much martin thank beautiful you, being with you my friend dear 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 thank you i hope you enjoyed our conversation with martin root you can learn more about martin at martinroot.com that's m-a-r-t-i-n r-u-t-t-e Dot com. And now in the second part of the podcast, it's just you and me. I'll tell you how to use the Paraliminal Sessions and the Mind Tracks app to easily handle obstacles and move toward the success you want, especially as it relates to Martin's message. If you're new to the relaxing Paraliminal Audio Sessions, they use breakthrough technologies to activate your whole mind in only 20 minutes to help you improve any area of your life. Let's get going. Hello, this is the follow-up session to my conversation with Martin Root and his work, Project Heaven on Earth. Absolutely loved being with Martin. I've known him for a number of years. His thinking, his philosophies, his dedication to humanity is so touching, so heartwarming. And I'm really glad I was able to share his insights with you. If you haven't known his work, I do hope you get into it in more detail. Now, there are a number of important concepts that we talked about that paraliminal technology can really help with. So I've listed them. They include creating a new story, starting now, possibility thinking and moving from belief to commitment, and living according to our values, our deepest held values. Now, a lot of paraliminals could be used, and my business partners like to say, just give one, but I'm going to break the rule and give you several in each category. So let's start with the idea of creating a new story. The new history generator is the ultimate tool to help you do that. Very often we'll come from a place in our histories where we've had traumas, we've had setbacks, we aren't where we want to be, but we would like a better future. So the new history generator is phenomenal with this because it does put you on a trajectory, not only reviewing your past, but also seeing the way forward to creating the life that you choose to create. And if you look at the arc of your life uh, from the time you were born till now, there's another paraliminal which was more recently developed called finding yourself. And that's to see that there is a deep, underlying purpose story set of gifts that have come with you in this lifetime. And if you can spot them, discover them, access, gain access to them, then your whole life is much more empowered to live into the fullest expression of your life's purpose. So finding yourself is a way of really discovering that deeper current of your life's great work. 
The second area is this idea of starting now. Why wait, as Martin and I said, why wait for something else? Let's start creating heaven and earth right now. And so there are a couple of paraliminals. Certainly one I refer to often in my follow-on sessions is Fresh Start, which I did with Bill Harris. The fresh Start is to recognize that, hey, it doesn't matter what's happened up until now. This is a moment right now to have a fresh start. And if we're going to create a new story for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, for humanity, it's to recognize that now is the time and we can get going on it. The second paraliminal would be gratitude because it recognizes the great fullness that is already a part of who we are in the life that we're living. And when we reinforce, when we appreciate what we've got, we can start right now from a sense of abundance that we have enough to do what is ours to do in this world. So gratitude, very helpful. And the third one is self-love. It's a great way to start right now is to recognize that you've got a younger you and you've got an elder you and come together with your present you in a sense of blessing, a sense of grace, a sense of connection, and really feeling in touch with the true power and potential that's within you. Very powerful paraliminal self-love. The third area I wanted to talk about is possibility thinking and moving from belief to commitment. Certainly the belief paraliminal is very helpful in establishing that. The prosperity paraliminal, really good because it, it helps you recognize that whatever it is you can dream is already possible for you. We wouldn't be given a goal if we weren't already given the resources necessary to fulfill on that goal. And that's a, a wonderful promise. And it's one that throughout my life, I've had the privilege to see play out in the lives of my clients over and over and over again. You have a high goal, even if it appears beyond what you believe could be possible, you can do it because you're given the resources necessary to make it so. The third paraliminal in this area would be power thinking, which is a, it's a really good one because it, it's getting behind what it is you're choosing to do and really focusing your intention on it. And if you go into life with intention and we bring our attention to what it is we're choosing to create and we live each day with no tension, about it, no doubts, no hesitation, no, no uh, fears, then we are going to live into and create that which we intend. It's a powerful paraliminal. So those three, prosperity, belief, and power thinking are all great with possibility thinking. And the fourth final area I want to talk about is living according to our values now, Martin spoke quite a bit about that and recognizing what it is that's important to you also comes through on the three questions that he poses and asks us to speak into. And uh, once you know that this is important to you, this is what you value, this is what you're truly willing to commit your life energy to now, Let's get on with it. And the get around to it paraliminal is spot on for that. The second paraliminal in this area <clears throat> would be conscious time, where you awaken and you consciously choose how you're going to live this day. Super powerful. If we go to the very first paraliminal I talked about, new history generator, session B in that is how did you live today? It's the mental review of the day. So conscious time at the beginning, mental review at the end. It's a great way to bookend your day and really recognize that you are choosing to live according to what you value most. And that's it. Those are the paraliminals I'd recommend. Creating a new story, starting now, possibility thinking, and living according to what you value most. Well, that's it. 
Thanks for being a part of this podcast. Great to be with you. Hope to see you again really soon. Bye for now. Thank you for joining me today. I applaud your willingness to maximize your potential. You can easily use the Paraliminal Audio Sessions in the MindTracks app to stimulate your non-conscious mind, that is your inner mind, to reduce any resistance in your life and to propel you toward the success you want. Go to www.mindtracks.com slash go. That's www.mindtrx.com slash go. These amazing audio tools have helped millions, and I encourage you to bring them into your world today. Be sure to be back for more episodes of the Mind Tracks podcast. You'll find insightful conversations with authors, experts, and thought leaders, all devoted to improving your life's experience. Thank you again for being here on our Mind Tracks podcast. <music>